mean if, um, if uh, you can't infringe on them? Um, if there was no such thing of, as infringement, there would be no such thing as uh, intellectual property rights, I suppose. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, infringement um, because that's ultimately the, uh, the point of all this intellectual property talk. So what is infringement? Uh, infringement is any breach of intellectual property rights. So it can involve copyrights, it can involve trademarks, it can involve any type of uh, patent. Um, and, and, it, and it has to do with the improper use of that protected intellectual property. So whether it's a copyrighted trademark or a, a, a patent, uh, the unauthorized use of that uh, intellectual property right is infringement. Now what types of uh, infringement are there? There's copyright infringement, there's patent infringement, and there's trademark infringement. I would also add that you could, you could also say that theft of trade secrets is a form of intellectual uh, property infringement because uh, 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 if I went down to the Coca-Cola plant and broke into their safe and took out the little piece of paper with the Coca-Cola formula on it, while it's not copyrighted or trademarked or uh, patented, it is a trade secret and my unauthorized use of that would, would constitute a type of infringement as well. So I would add trade secrets, I guess, to that little list. So what types of infringement are there? There's direct infringement, indirect infringement, induced infringement, and contributory infringement. And I want to go through these four types of infringement because the, the, uh, the names are not um, uh, necessarily um, an obvious indication of what uh, is involved. Well, direct infringement is the easy one, and that is the making, using, offering to sell selling or importing into the U.S. of an infringing product during the life of the patent without a license from the patent holder. And that literally comes directly from the uh, uh, chapter, uh, uh, Title 35. So that, that comes right out of the statute. So if you are um, uh, practicing someone else's patent, um, then you're guilty of direct infringement. Um, an example of practicing someone else's uh, patent, of, of course. Uh, let's go back to our, our, our hypothetical student from the famous technical university in Cambridge who uh, developed a, on his own time uh, outside of a class a hydrogen generating machine. Well, if you were to um, take that hydrogen generating machine patent and copy it, and try to sell your hydrogen generating machine to uh, someone, uh, that would constitute direct infringement of the patented hydrogen generating machine. Um, indirect patent infringement takes two forms. One is called contributory infringement and the, or inducement to infringe a patent. Um, patent law states whoever actively induces infringement of a patent shall be liable as the infringer. In other words, a company doesn't have to infringe a patent directly in order to be uh, sued or found liable for uh, infringement. And, and, and that's a good thing for inventors because oftentimes it's impossible, especially with online commerce, to catch the direct infringers. Oftentimes what, uh, what they do is they change websites, they operate from outside of the country, um, they, um, they uh, uh, conceal their URLs. And so you, oftentimes an inventor who owns intellectual property rights can't uh, uh, catch the direct infringer. So uh, there's this um, uh, provision in the act uh, whereby if you aid and abet the infringer knowingly, um, you're as guilty as the infringer, okay? And this is, so this is really good news for, um, for people that own intellectual property rights um, because uh, it's oftentimes very difficult to catch the direct infringer. All right, induced infringement. Um, induced infringement is what enables the direct infringer to practice the patented invention, okay? So examples of induced uh, infringement. Uh, you can help dir the direct infringer to assemble the patented uh, product. You can provide instructions that detail how to produce the patented invention. 
preparing instructions for consumer use, or licensing plans or a process which enable the licensee to produce the patented product or process. So let's take an example of a, of a pharmaceutical. Um, if you um, uh, are Novartis here in Cambridge and you have patented a uh, drug that uh, has a particular therapeutic purpose um, and um, uh, you, for, well, let's say you work at Novartis as well and you're aware of the formula that uh, is used uh, for, this, um, for this particular drug and um, uh, you start corresponding with somebody in China or somebody in South America to make this product and the two of you conspire together um, to sell this market as a, this, uh, this drug as a generic on the market. They may not be able to catch the direct infringer in Buenos Aires, Argentina or in Wuhan, China uh, because they're beyond the jurisdiction. But because you enabled the infringer by providing the formula or providing the plans or providing instructions on how to infringe, you're as guilty as the infringer. Um, guilty is the wrong word, really. Liable as the infringer. Although sometimes this can be considered a crime. There are criminal statutes that do sometimes uh, uh, come into play here. So the test for induced infringement is whether the inducer has demonstrated active aiding and abetting of the direct infringer's infringing activities. Oftentimes the, uh, the person uh, that's uh, liable for induced infringement is, is, plays a larger role in the, in the infringement than the direct infringer. Sometimes it's just a company in, um, in South America or in China uh, or uh, in Europe who you know, has batch mixers and follows instructions. They put a bunch of ingredients in and they produce the uh, pharmaceutical. But all of the information comes from the person uh, or party that's inducing it. And usually the induced infringer or the, the person that, or party that's involved in inducement of infringement is the one that's making most of the money. So it's really um, uh, important to those with intellectual property rights uh, that, uh, that Direct infringement is one thing, but being uh, able to enforce your patent from, uh, against those who induce infringement is sometimes not only equally important, but more important. Oh, uh, okay, uh, a contributor infringe, a contributing infringer is one who offers or sells within the United States or imports the United States a component of a patented machine, manufacturer, comb com combination, or composition or material or apparatus for use in practicing a patented process constituting a material part of the invention, knowing the same to be especially made or especially adapted for use in an infringement of such patent, and not a staple article of commerce suitable for substantial non-infringing use. That's from a statute. What does that mean? Let me give you an example. Um, who has a, um, I, I'm sorry, I can't think of the names of them. Uh, a designer handbag, uh, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, okay? Who, who's, been to, who's, been, who, who's been to China here? Have, have you ever taken a walk down the street in Beijing or in Qingdao or in Shanghai? You, you, there are literally factories set up just off the main road where they produce the most beautiful Gucci bags, the most beautiful Louis Vuitton bags and belts. You can buy these things anywhere in China. Um, and they're all knockoffs. They're all uh, infringing on the design or utility patents that belong to Louis Vuitton or um, uh, Gucci or some of the other famous designers' names of which I, I, uh, I'm not familiar. But um, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. You, has anybody ever, have you heard of Filene's Basement? I'm probably not old enough to know Filene's Basement. Filene's Basement was this great store in Boston, is, which is where Millennial Tower is in downtown. And it was a basement uh, store with floor upon floor of merchandise that, it, that was brought in, famous designer merchandise that was brought in after the season. And you could go down there and buy the most wonderful brand names uh, and designer things um, for one-tenth the cost. Um, it was all legal, um, but you have the same sort of stores in China 
but, however, uh, they're all illegal uh, because they're all selling uh, uh, designer merchandise without the permission of the designer. Usually what designers do is they sell them uh, on Newbury Street for uh, six months and when uh, the season changes, all of the clothes used to go to Filene's basement. And so you could buy Brioni suits and the most beautiful clothes and, and things for uh, a fraction of the price as soon as the, as soon as the fashion season changed. Well, it's, uh, it's that season 12 months a year in China. And um, uh, I don't know about you, but um, uh, one of the hardest things to do is to uh, sue and hold responsible these companies in China that infringe on all of these um, design and utility patents. And by the way, it's just not, you know, um, fancy pocketbooks and, and clothing. It now, now it's uh, very lar in very large part pharmaceuticals because China has a very, very large and a growing pharmaceutical um, production um, uh, industry. And so whether you're Louis Vuitton or no Novartis, you're finding that a lot of infringing is going on in China. Um, and you can't hold them liable because you just, you just you, Chinese authorities won't uh, enforce infringement actions. So what do you do? Well, uh, you rely on contrib contributory infringement. If those products are later offered for sale on a platform like Amazon, Amazon can be equally liable as the infringer. So this is very similar to um, uh, induced infringement uh, in that we can now uh, find another party responsible for the infringement uh, and it's a further protection for your intellectual property rights. So if you find um, your patent being sold on Amazon or one of the other online platforms, and there are so many of them, um, uh, you don't have to catch the, the infringer, the person that's actually manufacturing um, or practicing your patent uh, illegally. Um, you can uh, hold uh, um, uh, Amazon or any of the other online uh, platforms liable for, um, for infringement under a theory of contributory infringement. Um, now, how do you know if you're infringing? Okay, I mean, you build a better mousetrap, um, you think that, uh, you know, um, uh, you've come up with a good idea and the next thing you know you get a cease and desist letter from some lawyer saying you're infringing on my, on my client's patent. How do you, what's a fair way of determining whether or not you're, you're infringing? Well, the way you determine whether or not infringement is going on is you go to the claims. We've talked about um, the claims being an important part of a patent application. So in order to determine whether or not you're actually uh, engaged in infringement, what uh, the courts will do and what um, uh, the USPTO will do is they will go uh, to the uh, claims and they will read the claims and um, if um, what you are doing is disallowed by the claims, then you're most likely engaged in infringement. Um, and that's, that's how we, you know, if you think of the, the frame of a house uh, or a fence around a piece of property as defining um, the, the property rights of that homeowner, the claims are the same as a fence around a piece of property because the claims define the limits of the uh, rights of the intellectual property holder. So claims are like a fence around a piece of property. They define the property that is being protected. And if your device is uh, practicing uh, what the uh, uh, claim of the uh, patent holder describes you're infringing. If you're outside of those claims, or if, you do, or if you're doing more than those claims um, state, then you're probably not infringing. It's a little bit like set, setting, setting foot on, on, on a fenced-in piece of property. If, if you have both feet in, inside that property line, you're prob probably infringing. But if you have one foot inside the line and the other foot is somewhere else, you may not be infringing. That's really an easy way of looking at it. 
So um, patents are territorial and, and infringement is only possible where the, in the country where the patent uh, is in force. Um, uh, so for instance, using our China example, um, if you don't have, um, uh, if, you're, if your device is not registered in China, the Chinese may not be infringing on your patent by making whatever it is, the pharmaceutical or the, or, or the handbag or whatever it is, but by a, a third party bringing it into the country could be infringing uh, because your patent is valid only within the United States. So uh, a patent is territorial. You can't have infringement unless you're actually practicing the patent in a territory where the um, patent has, uh, is in force. So if a patent's granted in the United States, and then anyone in the United States is prohibited from, from practicing that patent. Um, but people in other countries uh, may be able to practice that patent without fear of infringement because um, your uh, device is not registered there. So the scope of protection uh, varies from country to country. Uh, and in some countries, uh, uh, patents are not, substa not substantially examined. Just, it, it depends on jurisdictions. Uh, nowadays, you know, if you come to my office uh, and you want, and you have a good idea, we'll probably have, um, once we register you here in the United States, we'll probably register you in, uh, in other countries as well. That's just because the world has, has shrunk. Um, I want to mention a, quickly something called the doctrine of equivalence. Um, it's one of those scary legal terms uh, that has to do with determining whether or not uh, a patent infringement is going on. So the doctrine of equivalence is a legal rule uh, in most uh, jurisdictions that allows a court to hold a party liable for a patent infringement even though the infringing device or process does not read on the technology or fall within the literal scope of a patent claim but nevertheless is equivalent. What, what do I mean by that? So you're, you're, you're accused of patent infringement and you say, uh-uh, I'm not infringing, read the claims of the patent, I'm not doing the same thing. Uh, and the patent uh, owner says, hey, that's not fair. Um, uh, what, you, what you're really doing is you're only making small changes uh, to, the, to the claim um, what you're doing is substantially equivalent to what the, uh, uh, my claim on my patented uh, protected device uh, says. Um, and the courts have said that my, making minor changes or minor differences between uh, the protected device and the supposedly infringing device, the fact that there are small differences in the claims is of no moment. You can still be held liable for... Um, uh, patent infringement under the doctrine of equivalence. Um, the test varies from country to country, but the process in, essentially involves reading a claim onto the technology of interest. If all of the claims elements are found in the technology, the claim, the claim is said to have read on that technology. If a single element from the claim is missing from the technology, the claim does not literally read on the technology, and the technology generally does not infringe uh, the patent with respect to that claim, except if the doctrine of, of equivalence uh, applies. In the U.S., the doctrine of equivalent analysis is applied to individual claim limitations, not to the invention as a whole. So the way we look at it here in the United States, remember we talked about multiple claims. Uh, it's important to have multiple claims oftentimes in order so that you can protect as much as you, as you can of your intellectual property. Remember we talked about one of the most important things in, in filing an application um, for um, a patent is to make sure that you've covered everything your device can do by all of the claims that you write. If you fail to describe something that your device can do in the claims and somebody comes along and practices your patent by doing something that you have not described in your claims, are they infringing? The answer is no, because you have not described that particular use of your invention in the claims. Remember, the claims are like the boundary fence around a piece of property. If you, if you forget to build, 
a piece of the fence around your property, that property is gone. That property can't be claimed by you. And so um, in this particular case, there's, there's a case called uh, Jenkins versus Hilton Davis. The Supreme Court stated the test is whether the difference between the feature in the accused device and the limitation literally recited in the claim is insubstantial. So um, uh, again, it, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if you are accused of uh, patent infringement, one of the main de defenses is to say that this is this what the practice that you're using it for goes beyond the claims that were made. And it would be incumbent upon the inventor to say, now hold on a second, you know, that's really a hyper-technical interpretation of the claims. You know, my, the, the infringing device is doing the same thing. It's substantially equivalent. And then depending on the case-by-case -case basis, uh, you may or may not uh, win um, uh, uh, your infringement action. Um, the, the test is, essentially this. Uh, does it perform the, essentially the same function in substantially the same way and to yield a, the same result? If it satisfies those cre three, three criteria, then uh, I think what you're dealing with is substantial equivalency. So, so it's not a literal reading on of the claims that's necessary in order to, form, uh, to, fi uh, to, um, uh, to find patent infringement. Um, so long as the function is the same, the method is the same, and the result is the same. Um, uh, for instance, there was a famous case involving the linkage uh, between the uh, gas pedal and the, and the engine of, of a motor vehicle. Even though the device uh, that, was, that claimed to be infringing was mechanically different from the patented device, um, because it performed the same function and the same method um, and had the same result, it was found to be infringing. Uh, this substantial equivalence test is, is, again, another really important protection for patent owners uh, because they don't allow infringers to get away with uh, technical, uh, te technical differences in what they're practicing uh, and the claims uh, of the uh, supposedly protected device. All right, uh, typical defenses to infringement actions. Uh, the infringer was not practicing the patented invention. Uh, that is the invention claimed in the patent. Uh, the claims define the extent of the protection conferred by a patent, and so the number one defense is I'm not practicing the patent because the claims don't include what I'm doing. Um, that's why claims are so important. Um, another defense is the infringing act was not performed uh, in the territory where the, uh, where the device uh, or the patent uh, is, um, is effective. So uh, you may cross over the border to, Ch to uh, Canada and practice uh, uh, a, uh, a patent if uh, there's no protection for it in Canada, um, uh, or in Mexico, or in South America. Um, uh, another defense, a typical defense, uh, is that the patent is expired. How long do patents last, right? So 20 years for a patent, 15 years for a design patent. Um, if, um, and, and that date is measured back to the date of original filing. Um, so uh, a lot of, lot of companies uh, literally sit there rubbing their hands together, uh, watching the clock and the calendar for a patent to expire so that they can, um, they can uh, go out and, and build their own and practice uh, uh, as soon as the, as the patent has expired. Um, another um, another uh, typical defense uh, is that the patent is invalid because the invention in question does not meet the, um, the um, patentability requirements under the law. Um, and and that's, that's an important one. That, in fact, that's a defense that is used more often than not when, um, when I encounter patent infringement cases. Um, a patent is invalid because the invention in question does not meet the patentability requirements. So, Next, uh, on our last class on Friday, we're going to be talking about the CRISPR decision. I've talked about this case several times during the course of the uh, term. 
um, but it's one of the most famous patent infringement cases, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, in this community, because it involves the Broad Institute. And the defense in that case was, hey, we're not infringing on um, Stanford's patent because uh, we're doing something that their patented technology can't do. They never should have received a patent uh, for this gene editing sequence as it applies to human beings because the work that they'd done on the, uh, on the, on the gene editing sequence um, uh, was not, unable to demonstrate utility. They weren't able, remember we talked about the, the four requirements for patentability. Well, there was no utility because, the, um, because they had not been able to demonstrate the efficacy of this gene editing technology on human beings. So the Broad said, hey, we're not, we're not infringing on anybody's patent. In fact, we deserve a patent on this technology as it applies to human beings. And of course, um, I'm not giving anything away, I don't think, next, uh, next Friday, but that's, that's how they won. Um, and uh, the, the other def defense is that there's a license under the patent which has been granted. Now, you might say, well, how does someone know, not know there's a license? Uh, oftentimes, you'd be surprised um, at, the, at, at, how, at how these things can get complex. The patent owner oftentimes will license um, the ability to, to practice their patent to multiple users. Um, there's nothing that says that you have to provide an exclusive to somebody. So if you have a hydrogen generating machine and you uh, license the technology uh, uh, to um, uh, to Lincoln Laboratories uh, for research purposes. That doesn't mean you can't then take that same technology and license it to McDonnell Douglas so that they can build prototypes uh, for sale or license it to the Air Force or license it uh, to, um, to Grumman. You can, you can literally license um, uh, it to as many uh, users as who will pay you money for it. Obviously, uh, granting an exclusive license is sometimes much more um, more lucrative, more valuable, but oftentimes, um, you know, uh, in infringement actions, uh, people are practicing patents believing that they have a license and they don't. So it can get kind of complex in the, in the, in the licensing uh, area, uh, especially when there are inventions that have tremendous commercial application and there are multiple licenses and types of licenses. There's royalty-free licenses, there's research licenses, there's Commercial licenses, you know, somebody may be um, uh, commercially exploiting a patent when their license only allows them to do uh, basic research. So there's all kinds of defenses that involve licensing of, of patents. Um, another type of infringement, but, uh, you know, just like, um, just like patent infringement, copyrights and trademarks can be infringed as well. Um, if you're using uh, or copying a work without permission, you're probably engaged in copyright infringement. Um, copyright infringement disputes are usually resolved through direct negotiation. Uh, uh, first thing that happens is you get a cease and desist letter in the mail from somebody like me. Uh, and then if uh, things don't work out, uh, the next thing you do is you get a summons and complaint served by a sheriff. Uh, asking you to answer a complaint that's been filed most likely in the United States District Court for, um, for copyright infringement. And very serious, uh, a large-scale commercial infringement uh, is often considered criminal. I mean, uh, uh, counterfeiting is another form of copyright infringement. So you can't, uh, you can't go into your basement and, and start printing up $10 bills. Um, that's, um, that's technically copyright infringement, but the Secret Service will probably come by and charge you with something much more serious than that. But technically, it's nothing more than copyright infringement. Um, again, with, um, uh, and this is a, a function of the electronic age we live in, uh, advances in di digital technology have really required us to sort of change the definition of copyright infringement and trademark infringement. While the statutes themselves, uh, in, in the patent statute, Title 30, 35, does have a section that talks about indirect infringement. 
But the copyright and the trademark statutes don't have sections that refer to indirect uh, copyright infringement or indirect trademark in infringement. But the Supreme Court has said what's fair is fair. Uh, and again, for the same reasons that it's oftentimes difficult, if not impossible, to catch the direct infringers, um, uh, indirect infringement is uh, uh, also uh, a way of dealing with copyright infringement. The Supreme Court has established causes of actions in trademark and copyright for indirect infringement. And again, an example of indirect infringement uh, is uh, publication of these things on various platforms. Um, everybody everybody uh, uh, nowadays publishes on various electronic media. So while you can copy a, uh, 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 a scientific paper or a scientific journal uh, or a scientific process uh, and be the direct uh, infringer, um, uh, you may be in a jurisdiction of, uh, where you, you, know, you may be in Kazakhstan or you may find that your work is being copied by somebody um, in, um, in a country uh, that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't recognize copyright law the same as here in the United States. And they're beyond your ability to, to prosecute. So what does the copyright owner do? Um, uh, and this is something that big publishing houses deal with all the time. You know, um, Can you imagine how many places Harry Potter has been, um, has been, has been printed and published? Um, uh, and, and there are online versions of the book, and there are books uh, offered that, that, that are uh, copyright infringement that have been printed in China and sold online. Well, you can't get the infringers uh, because they may be beyond your, your ability to prosecute, but the intermediaries can be held liable for indirect infringement. So if Amazon is selling, um, you know, a... Um, uh, a, a, an infringing version of the King James Bible, okay? Amazon can be liable, even if you can't get to the, uh, to the actual infringer. If, um, if uh, some other scientific platform is publishing your paper without your authority, uh, which they receive from someone else, uh, a contributor, um, they can be held liable for uh, indirect uh, copyright infringement. With trademarks and copy, indirect trademark and indirect copyright infringement, there's a, there's a first step, though, that you have to make. And that is you come and you hire a lawyer like me, and you say, hey, look, you know, somebody's infringing on my work, and they're selling it on these various platforms. Well, in order to be held liable for indirect uh, infringement, the intermediary has to be aware of it. So the first thing we do is we send a letter. And we say, hey, you may not be aware of this, but uh, you're selling uh, on your platform an infringing work. Uh, and we, we request that you stop doing it. And usually what happens is they get taken down immediately. There are some uh, platforms that have so many um, uh, uh, different parts to them that uh, sometimes it becomes difficult to get the platforms to cooperate uh, fully. And sometimes they get away with it by saying, well, you know, we didn't really know what uh, uh, these affiliated platforms were doing, so we weren't aware of the infringement. So we have language in letters that we send out that talks about how they have to not only take it down from their platform, but the platforms of all affiliates and related sites. So a lot of these a lot of these online um, platforms have hundreds of different uh, uh, sub-platforms that are available. Um, and, and this is where a lot of infringement, especially music. Think of how many, how many platforms there are. Um, there's Spotify. They, I mean, I, I can sit up here and spend the last 25 minutes just going through the number of platforms there are out there for music. Well, what if you're the, you know, what if you're the original artist? You know, getting them, getting things taken down from those platforms can be very difficult because there are um, so many uh, sub-platforms uh, owned, by, owned by these media companies. A media company can have 300 different platforms. 
And getting it taken down off of all of those requires a little bit of uh, a little bit of ingenuity. But what we do is we put it right on them, and and we let them know that they're you know that they're hosting um, the infringement the infringement of somebody's work. And it usually usually works because why? Because uh, of the cause of action that exists against indirect infringers. Uh, yes. Just to talk about infringing, about 30 years ago, there was a student in one of the dorms who came from Taiwan, and they were selling the freshman calculus book published in China that had been written by Professor Thomas of the math department. And I think MIT dealt with that internally. The yeah. person was threatened with uh, dismissal. From the it's, a, it's a great example. You know, the, the owner of the, of, of, of the intellectual property rights can't do anything about somebody in China who decides that they're going to, or in some other jurisdiction, um, they're going to uh, infringe on their work. But if you can, if you can um, go to where they're selling it or using it, the intermediary is equally liable. And so, yes, sir? What happens if it's a big platform like YouTube, and YouTube claims that it's functionally impossible for them to pull everything down all the time so that there may be, at all times, content that's constantly infringing on people's hands. Yeah, you know, um, that's been the big defense. Um, the bigger they are defense, uh, that, and, and you know, I've seen cases where it's, where it's broken both ways. Uh, the, uh, the platform that, that uh, the equivalent platform is, is, is Amazon. I mean, they're just enormous. And, you know, they always come into court and they say, well, we didn't know, we didn't know. Well, of course, if you are able to, if you have smart lawyers and your smart lawyers write a good letter and, those, and that letter directs YouTube where they need to pay attention um, about infringement, it's really hard for them to wiggle out of it. Um, so what you've really got to do is you've got to put it on them. So you've got to, you've got to do a lot of digging yourself. Uh, usually, though, that's... Uh, pretty easy because people will come to the patent or uh, technology, you know, uh, rights owner and say, "Hey, did you know that I just read your paper on online?" So, you know, you can usually identify where the infringement is taking place, even if Amazon or YouTube is too big to know. So, what you do is you educate them, and once you've—I don't know of a case where. Um, a, a, an outfit as large as YouTube or, or Amazon has been served with, um, with particulars about where the infringement is going on that they've been uh, able to wiggle out of it. So it's up to us. But, but there's, there's no way that they could be taken to court because they almost knowingly benefit from constant infringement on their platform and they knowingly use that defense. Right, like there's, there's no one that's trying to sue them because, because their business model directly benefits from their inability to. You're right, it's, but it's an implicit characteristic of their, of their business model. I mean, it's like, you know, everybody's winking, they know that they're making money off of this, but until you can establish, and it's your burden to establish that they knowingly violated it, um, you probably won't prevail. And that's why the first thing that happens is we send the oh my god letter. You know, and that's, that, that, and, cause that provides the predicate. Once they get that, their tune changes, no pun intended. Um, but uh, we've had them take down all kinds of music and uh, compositions and things like that, whereas um, um, they would have, um, what's, the, um, what's, the, what's the term, plausible deniability, right? You know. Um, we try, to, we, try to, we try to deprive them of plausible deniability. Anyhow, um, the, the typical defenses, inval, invalidity, um, you know, we've talked about the requirements for copyright. Um, so, you know, was it in the public domain? Um, was it, uh, you know, uh, uh, was, it, was it like happy birthday? Did, did, did they actually never own it? Okay, so it's invalidity would be one defense. <laughs> the statute of limitations is a common defense. In the United States, you have three years from the date of, that the cause of action accrued within which to bring suit. 
So the date on which you knew or reasonably should have known your invention or your copyright was being infringed or your trademark was being infringed, you have three years from that date. Even though it's good for the life of the author and 21 years, as soon as you find out about it, the clock starts ticking, you have three years. If, if more than three years goes by, uh, then you've lost any right to uh, enforce it. Uh, public domain, we've talked about. Fair, fair use, we've talked about. You know, as long as it's transformative uh, and it's uh, a parody or a political commentary of some kind, um, uh, that's a defense to copyright infringement. A mistake. Um, you know, the infringement was an accident. We had no idea, or it was an innocent uh, uh, use of the, um, uh, of the uh, material. Uh, that's the kind of defense that doesn't really fly very well when you're selling something, but it might fly if you're sort of innocently referring to somebody, something, especially in a, in a, in a paper or something like that. Um, we've gone through fair use. Um, examples of fair use, a few lines from a Bob, a Bob Dylan song in a music review, uh, that's okay. The more of the song that you uh, quote, the, uh, the worse it gets for you. Summarizing quoting from a medical article uh, on cancer uh, in a news report, that's fair use. That's just, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Copying a few paragraphs from a news article uh, for use for educational purposes, uh, I think I'm okay with that. Um, that's, not inf that's not infringement. Or copying a portion of a book or a magazine article for use in a related court case. Anything that goes on in court um, is uh, probably uh, privileged. Um, anyhow, um, we've covered fair use to, to an uh, extraordinary amount, and, and I don't think that we need to spend more time on it here. I did want to get to the biggest, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, these are the most aggressive companies in the world when it comes to infringement actions. Uh, Adidas uh, and Puma, which are rival German companies that started at about the same time, have been locked in a death struggle for the last uh, 40 years. Um, they have set records for suing each other uh, or countersuing each other uh, in order to uh, enforce their various design and utility patents. Um, they are in this world, as far as I know, the most aggressive infringement uh, litiga litigators uh, that there are. Um, and um, in this particular case, which started in 2005 and was settled in 2018, think of the massive amount of money spent on lawyers for uh, over 13 years. <coughs> Adidas uh, uh, was trying to protect their three-stripe design uh, in a lawsuit uh, against uh, Puma. Um, they say uh, that Puma's soccer cleats infringed uh, on their three-stripe design. So you be the jury on this one. You tell me who won and who lost. Here is Adidas three-stripe design, okay? And here's the Puma shoe that Adidas said was infringing. What Adidas said is these four horizontal stripes uh, were an infringement uh, on their, in fact, to use, of, to use the words of the case, Puma's use of four diagonal stripes on the side of the infringing cleat is a blatant attempt by Puma to trade on the goodwill and commercial magnetism Adidas has built up in a three-stripe mark and to free ride on Adidas' fame as a preeminent soccer brand. I don't know, you tell me. You think it's infringement? Yeah? You, th you, you, think, you think that they're trading on, on Adidas' goodwill and commercial it's magnetism? Got, it's got similar design language, right? Like it's, it's the same angle. Like they're, they're clearly trying to use subconscious association with the brand. I, I disagree. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, this is. Yeah. <laughs> they gotta prove that. They. The burden of proof is on Adidas to prove that there's magnetism. And, and the. the and the standard is the reasonable person test. What would the well, reasonable you person find conclude? A reasonable person? <laughs> so then they find Adidas. I find hundred German soccer players, and 
and I, I try to, to see if they haven't seen the shoe before, and I show them, and then ask them, what company, what company do you think has made this shoe? And if they answer Adidas, you know, 51 of them out of 100, or any, any reasonable portion, 30% even, right? <laughs> There's a profits lost by Adidas, 30% of people. One of the devices that lawyers use in cases very typically is they commission surveys. And they'll go up to people on the street and they'll show them pictures of two, show, two shoes. And then, you know, the person that does that conducts the public survey comes into court and they testify about their methods and what they did. And they say, you know, out of 99 people that we showed this to, you know, 96 of them confused it with an Adidas shoe. And that's admissible. Uh, it goes to the issue of whether or not a reasonable person would find confusion. Confusion is usually the, the, the magic word when it comes to infringement. If um, the public would confuse um, your brand with someone else's uh, because of the way the design is, then it's probably uh, an infringement. Um, so this is um, uh, this, this just talks about the um, uh, about uh, their history of litigation. Um, I hate to spoil the um, the the um, uh, I hate to spoil the the story, but uh, what happened is Puma and Adidas eventually settled the case. So nobody won, nobody lost. Uh, yes. Why did they choose to pursue this case in the U.S. court rather than the Ah, because in the U.S. courts. Uh, uh, punitive and uh, attorney, punitive damages and attorney's fees are available. So um, that is not only good for the the um, uh, um, the owner of the of the intellectual property because it it adequately compensates them for their financial loss, but it acts as a tremendous deterrent. The the purpose of these suits is not to get money from Puma. The purpose of these suits is to er erect a vertical um, uh, monopoly. Uh, they want to so protect the brand that um, the amount of money that they get paid in these lawsuits, assuming that they're, that they're uh, successful, means nothing to them. What means everything to them is, is uh, exclusive use of the brand and making it as wide and as broad as possible. Yes? You ever seen the little bracelets that uh, wrap around have two balls on the end that will cure your cancer? <laughs> so I was involved in two lawsuits. The first one was the male, or someone was suing the, the guy who was selling these because it was false, false advertising. Oh, really? And they lost because they could not prove it was false. Okay? They had the burden of proof. Then this guy who was selling these and making a fortune said, this is pretty good. He was going to sue the Mayo Clinic because the Mayo Clinic doctors had actually done a study and found that there was no difference between those who wore them and not didn't wear them, right? And he lost because he couldn't prove that the Mayo Clinic was wrong. Okay. Hoist on his own petard. The burden of proof. Right, the burden of proof. I know uh, Professor Eager has something to, 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 uh, to mention to you at the end of class. I'll just end on this. Um, this is the Adidas three-stripe logo. Does anybody recognize the logo on the, on the left? Bingo. Yeah. And, and Tesla would rather switch than fight. There's an old cigarette commercial. Oh my god, I'm really getting old. There used to be a cigarette commercial. The whole brand was they'd rather, you'd rather switch to another brand than, than switch to this brand than fight or something like that. Um, rather than fight, uh, the litigious uh, people at Adidas, um, Tesla just, you walk up to a Tesla now, you will not see those horizontal stripes. They took them off their cars. I don't know how you're going to confuse a Tesla for a pair of soccer shoes. You know, I, if I was advising Tesla, maybe I, I, might, I might have fought that one a little bit, but um, there you have it. Um, uh, oftentimes the point of these things is not the damages uh, because there really are no damages. The point is creating these monopolies, uh, uh, and that's what, uh, that's what Adidas is famous for. All right, so um, one last story. Anybody see, ever, anyone ever see this before? Do you know what that's called? That's called Jumping Man. Um, the one on the right 
is the, is the uh, iconic logo of, that Nike created of uh, um, Michael Jordan dunking a basketball. The one on the left was actually a silhouette of an image taken by a photographer who sold it to Life magazine for $15,000 and then licensed it to uh, Nike uh, for a small amount of money, whereupon Nike went right out and created their own silhouette and didn't, and didn't pay uh, actually anything for it. Um, and there was a big lawsuit between the photographer that sold this, this uh, image initially to Life magazine and then licensed it for very limited purposes to uh, Nike, who then just went out and blatantly stole the thing. Um, and eventually, uh, the, uh, the guy in the Jumpman uh, suit won his, um, uh, won, his, uh, won his lawsuit. Actually, it was, it was settled. Um, uh, uh, but um, uh, this, is the, this is the words of the court. Simply, could, simply put, the, the, um, the photographer does not have a, a monopoly on Mr. Jordan, his appearance, his athletic prowess, or images of him dunking a basketball. Um, on February 27th, 2018, in a 2-to-1 two two decision, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, one of my favorite circuits, um, uh, except in this case, uh, decided that the photographer did not show that Nike misappropriated his 1984 uh, photo of Jordan, which had been used in that Life magazine article. So the little guys uh, get screwed again. There's all these mockudramas. Uh, there's one of Star Trek. Oh my God, the fighting between, you know, you're using Spock's pointy ears, uh, you're using the Klingon language, you're infringing. Uh, all of these, uh, there's, there's so much of this stuff out there nowadays, um, mocu mockument mockumentaries. Um, in this particular case, um, uh, uh, the owners of Star Trek sued the makers of a mockumentary uh, who had crowdfunded themselves. Uh, eventually what happened is they settled the case and the mockumentary was allowed to, uh, uh, to be shown uh, uh, with limited... Um, uh, limited, uh, in limited theaters. So anyhow, um, those are just some examples of infringement and I think the, the underlying um, lesson for it all is that it depends oftentimes. Uh, oftentimes it depends on the eye of the beholder, uh, how close it is, whether there's confusion, and whether or not there's any good reason for, to be able to use those things or not. Uh, the, and uh, oftentimes the little guys, like the photographers for Life magazine, uh, usually end up uh, with the short end of the stick to the giant corporations. Um, so with that, um, uh, I'll go into, my, go into my favorite infringement case on Friday, which is our last class together, which is the CRISPR decision. It really illustrates an awful lot of the uh, concepts that we've been talking about uh, all term. Uh, we'll kind of wrap it up in one uh, neat little package, and, um, and, um, and that will be it. Um, any questions? Any concerns? Sorry I missed class last week. I was sick as a dog, but I feel much better now, and I'm confident that I haven't uh, passed it on to you guys. At least that's what they tell me. So thanks for coming. Um, it was nice not to lecture in front of an empty classroom. See you, fri okay, next, see you Friday. That gets to the next, the next announcement. I'll send the letter around, but this may be the last required class of this class. I'm going to probably allow people to do their presentations by video in the dorm room or the apartment and email them in, okay? Uh, because of the coronavirus, and we're not going to stop the epidemic, it will go across the country, but we can reduce the number of people who get infected, okay? And so you're supposed to be flex flexible in this class, and one flexibility here is the rest of this class is going to be on. Yes. Oh, are we doing? Are we doing Friday? Uh, I mean, or if you want to use one of your old lectures on Christmas, they can watch an old lecture. Who wants to come for breakfast on Friday? All right, we're coming for breakfast on Friday. I have class. I have. I have course evaluations. One of the things that's really important to me, in order to make this a more meaningful.